and I will start. Yep, you can share your screen. Sharing my screen. If you can see it there. There we go, yes. Okay, I wanted to give a little context first of when the, the Tendedero started. Uh, that's me at art school. Ah. And I actually became a, a feminist when another woman in a class, a fellow student, talked about women artists. And I was terribly surprised because not one single woman artist had ever been mentioned, not even Frida Kahlo. Frida Kahlo wasn't the icon she is today. And at the end, all my male fellow students who came from a very strong movement in 1968 when there was a student massacre in Mexico, and they were all radical, highly political, et cetera, told us that women weren't as creative as men because we had children and our creativity uh, sort of blurred with motherhood, you know? And apart from thinking that was kind of stupid and unscientific, I didn't understand that if I ever wanted my work to be seen or the work of other women artists, part of my work was to change the system. So I immediately started assuming myself as a feminist and working in this, in this uh, sense. Let me see. Uh, at one point, when it was a Women's International Year in Mexico, one of the art magazines here had an interview with Judy Chicago. Uh, printed an interview with Judy Chicago, the artist Arlene Raven, the feminist art historian. And I learned that there was a feminist art school in Los Angeles, so I figured I had to go there, you know, by then. And the two years that took me to, to save enough money to go there, I joined the feminist art movement. And that's the feminist art movement, all 30 of us, you know, and we were working uh, issues like uh, abortion, which was illegal uh, in, in Mexico, and against forced sterilization, which happened mostly uh, with, with in, indigenous and original people's groups in, in Mexico, you know, so that's what we work for. And uh, you see me there at the, forth, at the front with my eyeglasses in front of the sign, and the woman standing right behind me that looks very much like me is my mother, who went with me to the demonstration because it was a time of a lot of, of repression, and she was worried that something might happen to me. My father was across the street and Victor, uh, who has been my, my companion since then in art and life, was photographing and documenting all of this. But just to give you a bit of the idea of the context of what was going on. The first clothesline was in 1978 before I went to the women's building. And uh, it was in an exhibition of young artists doing this kind of work that was performance installation, work that wasn't considered uh, traditional. It was experimental at the time. And uh, it was young artists, which was also quite a, quite a new thing for the museum. And the theme of the exhibition was the city. So I figured I would uh, make a piece that talked about what I disliked the most of the city, which was harassment in the public transport, which I took every day. Uh, and I, I asked this question, as a woman, what do you dislike or detest the most of the city? And then it was interesting because we didn't even have the vocabulary to talk about harassment at the time. Uh, the feminist movement was so small that we were working on abortion and starting to work on rape. Something like harassment was still very, very far away, you know? And the interesting part for me was I went out in the street to different groups Friends of mine helped me get answers. And usually was, what do you dislike of the city? Uh, pollution, the traffic, you know? And then I would say, and don't you just hate it when they grab your butt in the bus? And they would say, yes. And I'd say, write that. Because this piece is not, uh, it's not a, a sociological survey. It's, an, it's, a, it's a symbolical piece that narrates a situation that has been hidden before. So it's this narration, and in, in it, women would immediately write. It was interesting because it, called, it, it had a lot of attention from the beginning, from the media, from other artists. And it, at the time, we didn't have pieces that were participatory inside a museum. And still, women would come up and take a piece of paper down and write wherever they could their own answers. So very early on, I, I understood that there was a piece that, that uh, really spoke to women. And, and men were very interested in reading as well. 
uh, not necessarily agreeing because obviously the, the way we had all been educated, it's still very hard for men to understand why, why cat calls and, and grabbing our butt in the metro, et cetera, is not appropriate and adequate because they've been educated to, to think uh, uh, that happens, you know? So this is the context of other works at the time. I show them uh, because they've been part of shows like Radical Women, uh, a feminine, Latin American feminist art, 1960 to 1985. And for example, the one in the middle on top is a sign that says, young woman masturbating. And that was a scandal at the time, you know? And Paula Weiss's video at the bottom talked about the woman in the city. And I was very surprised because it was the first time in my life I ever saw uh, a naked woman who had cellulitis and birthmarks dancing. You know, it was a, a real woman in a video piece where it was not the analogy of woman and nature, but woman and city. So it was little things that from art we were starting to, to question. The second clothesline I did was in Los Angeles when I went to study over there. And I worked with Suzanne Lacey, uh, who has a lot of feminist artworks that have to do with social interaction, and social practice. And it, it, she had been asked to do a piece in Ocean Park, the community of Ocean Park, to decrease the level of sexual violence against women. And it was interesting because there were, th th that kind of work didn't really exist at the time. We were just beginning to name it and figure out what it was or what it could be. And I decided to do the clothesline again, even though at the time, whenever you did ephemeral work performances, installations, you were supposed to do it once and never again. This whole thing of reactivating them and repeating them has come later on in, in the history of art. But it was interesting to me because it went from the museum to the street. And it's a piece that you can do with a line and some pins and whatever you need. And it was interesting because at the time we went to the neighborhood and knocked on the doors and women would come out, we would invite women to come out and write their answers. And many of the women didn't know each other. So that piece served for women to get to know each other. And what better way to be safer in your own neighborhoods than to have the kind of networks with your neighbors that you can protect yourselves. The answers were, were hung up at the public library in Ocean Park. So each time I've made a clothesline, I learn different things. And it's a piece that varies and adapts to each context. The piece remained asleep until there was this very big, important uh, exhibition in California called Wack Art and the Feminist Revolution. And they asked me to do the piece again. And that was very strange to me. You know? So I decided to just put the documentation uh, and, and that was all that was presented at that time. And that gave the piece another visibility and it started coming up again, you know. And then in 2009, I was asked by a university in Mexico to redo it in the context of an exhibition that was visibilizing women's participation in the, because in 2010, we celebrated 200 years of our independence and 100 years of the Mexican Revolution. So I did it at the university and I asked two questions that were kind of, what are the advantages and disadvantages of being a man or being a woman? And it was cute, you know, I don't give birth, I can pee standing up, I go to bars on Thursday, women here, and, and, and I, don't get, I don't have to pay an entrance fee. But I didn't feel it had worked. I, I, I felt it, it hadn't worked, you know, uh, something just didn't stick. And I started thinking about this is a piece that really has to do with its context and to respond to its context is for it to be really, to have any real deep meaning, not just like another piece that happens and then nothing happens and then that's it. It had to really have, a, be, have an anchor in, in the community. So the next time I did it in Colombia, I said, I'm, I, what I want to do is give a workshop with artists and activists. And then we decide on the question that we're going to ask and you decide on where we're going to go to get it. So it's a piece that is made by the community each time and can change according to their needs. So by this time, we didn't even need a post or a palm tree to hang it. We could hang it on our arms and go out. And it's always very important. So when we ask people to answer, that we, that we already have some answers because a po whole piece works between 
having been reading the answers and then participating. And one of the questions they decided to have was when, when was the first time you were harassed? And at the time, I don't know if there was a hashtag that went a lot through Latin America. When was your when was the first time you were harassed? It, well, if it was a bit before or after, but I was very surprised to read all the answers. You know, when I was six, when I was twelve, and even I remembered being uh, touched by a guy in the street when I was eight. And even though I'd been a feminist by then for thirty or more years, I had never thought it was this was a social problem. I had thought I had met the only idiot who thinks it is correct to touch a little girl in the street or wherever, you know. So each piece has taught me a lot of things as well. So that became a very significant uh, answer. It has a, a question. It has also been interesting because sometimes when I put the clothesline and I see all the very painful answers, I, I sort of want to protect little girls and don't read it. And then I think you have to read it. You have to read it and you have to participate because you're one of the main victims of this violence, you know? So it's sort of makes me think of all these things. Then it was very interesting that same year because a teacher took the same methodology to apply in her class. So since then, the piece has worked as activism, as art and in an educational context, which I think is very interesting that is not just being part of the art world, but, but moved to all these other places. She still continues doing it every year and we keep in touch with the photographs she sends. In 2016, 2000, yes, it's hard to me for me to think of the numbers and the dates in, in English. Uh, it went into the museum of uh, the university, our main university's museum. And there it was very elegant with a steel frame and everything. But what was interesting is that it lasted six months in the museum. And I think that when activist work ends up in a museum, you can't just plunk it there like an object. For, for me and for Karen Cordero, who was the curator of this exhibition, having a feminist art exhibition isn't a means, but a means. It's the means to get the conversation going and to do a lot of events that talk about these issues. It's not just now I'm a well-known artist and my work is in the museum, all the, all the country, you know? So the piece uh, lasted there for six months and we had a lot of activities around it. The first question was obviously, have you ever been harassed at school of or university? Which was not something that was really being spoken about a lot about here, or it was spoken by a few groups that the universities weren't really paying much attention to it. So it was interesting to have that question. I thought I was going to be censored at one point. And by now in my life, I say, if you're not going to let me ask that question, I'm not going to participate, you know? So I was very uh, dominant about the whole thing. And no, there was no problem. The National University is quite open about this. Another thing I had was an archive of other women working on this because there were very few, but when I started, there were none. So for me, it's very interesting. Yes, we're still doing the clothesline. 45 years later, we're still doing it and we're still facing the same problems. But 2016, there were already a lot of groups and since then to today in Mexico, there's tons of feminist art groups of very young, very, very, very young and very, 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 very young women artists who are, who are working on these issues and have a very clear conscience. So I think it is interesting to, to, to mention them. And I always talk about their work so that it's also known, you know, because then you get an older artist like me, at least here going into the museum and then they forget about all the others. And then the museums have their token woman and they don't have to do anything else. And, and it's something we have to be working against constantly. Another interesting thing that happened is that Monica Benitez who's a researcher, a researcher at another university who works with uh, archives that come from artist pieces, like mine, an, archi an archive and all this material comes out. So she has been studying the answers we get and comparing, for example, the difference of the answers in Washington, in Argentina, and in Mexico, and figuring the difference of the kind of information you can get from these answers, because it's not a sociological survey where you get the age, the name, the region of the person, but you get a lot of other information that is really interesting and valuable and has to be taken into account. So it's another use of the, of the clothesline that has become very, very interesting, that it's not just the one occasion 
but also what happens with all the material that, that, that is, happens there. Amnesty International here asked me to do it and we did it in the street with their color, which is yellow and pink. And I usually, even though if you're going to do anything feminist in Mexico right now, it's usually the colors are green and purple. Uh, I, I also, I always ask them to leave at least one little pink part, part of the questions to remind us that it comes from another time as a historical reference. And that it was a time that we were just as women sort of saying, yes, we want equal rights, we want all these things, but what we have to contribute as women in what we have done earlier and everything that comes from the house and everything that comes from be, from taking care, from being the ones that take care is also important and is also valuable. So it was like va valuing ourselves as women and what we have done up to then, then and, and, and wanting to also participate in everything else. So I always uh, ask for, for that color. One that was very interesting to me was this one I did in 2016 at the, at the psychology faculty in our university. And I was going to give a lecture and then we were going to decide what question and do a clothesline. And before I started the talk, I said, I'm going to the bathroom, just a second. And I went to the bathroom and every booth has a panic button because it's so dangerous for women to go to the bathroom. And I had remembered from the philosophy faculty that there used to be little signs that said, don't walk into the bathroom alone because many women have been raped. But for the university to, this, this was the solution, a panic button that usually didn't work, obviously, you know, when you needed it, it didn't work. But uh, I think that it, that might be a good, a good policy at one point, like in Mexico City, public transport is divided by men and women, but it's ridiculous to leave it like that. You have to implement all sorts of other measures particularly educational measures, particularly if it's within a university. All these things, all the, uh, the change that we need in terms of sexual violence, and I would think of many other violence, has to come from education for it to be real. You might have punitive systems and you might have jails, but if things don't change educationally and in changing the discrimination that exists, nothing is going to change, it's just going to get worse. So I always say that having men and women in separate cars in the metro and the, and the metro bus here in the underground is just telling men that they are, they are beasts that can control themselves and it's telling women that we can't defend ourselves. And it's telling society that they don't need to participate. I think that when society participates and they see someone being harassed or discriminated and a lot of us participate and take action and don't let that happen, then all these things will decrease, you know? So obviously the question there was, what do you feel when you go to the bathroom and you find a panic button, you know? Whenever I do the piece um, at, at, in museums in other places of Mexico City, I ask if it's uh, to work with the artists there and that it's not just an exhibition of my work, but that local artists also participate. And this one was in Culiacán, the north of Mexico, where the, the drug cartels are the, traditionally being the strongest. And this woman could see clothesline. She did a clothesline right in front of mine, but she first did a performance where she walked in the street with an ice box on her head, like the ones where you buy beers and, and, and take home of this very light material. And she walked around the city naked with this because when people are decapitated by the narcs, their heads appear in these ice boxes. And women's bodies appear who suffer feminicide, and by the way, there's between 10 and 13 feminicides in Mexico every day, and their, their bodies appear, uh, they're thrown into the river. So she did this piece naked in the street and caused a terrible scandal, a scandal that doesn't happen when, when women are murdered or, or men are decapitated. And then she did this performance that the police went after her, but they couldn't recognize who she was, so they couldn't find her or anything. And there was this hashtag Lady Beachy, which is like Lady Naked, a big scandal in Twitter, et cetera. And then she did this performance where she asked the audience to clean her. And in the end, her mother came in and hugged her. And that clothesline was right in front of my clothesline. And I think it's, uh, for me, it's far more moving than even my clotheslines. But it's very interesting that 
it's not just my clothesline, but all these other clotheslines and ways of talking about this that respond to each community that I find particularly interesting. In Tuxtla Gutierrez, we also did one and we went in the, in the street and it was a lot of fun because you see one of the little girls answers. She made this drawing of us doing, and then she went with us all over the place. We told her what the piece was about and she would tell us, you haven't asked those people yet about to answer your question and those, but you know, this part of involving children is very important to me. Another thing that was interesting is that recently the students have done a lot of spontaneous close lines denouncing teachers. It's like a me, an analog me too. I will be talking about more about that. But some of the women who participated in the clothesline with me work at the university and they've been taking the answers from the women to change the protocols so that the protocols really respond to the answers. So it's another work that a way that it's been working that these answers from the students that not very many universities really take seriously and very many of them are freaked out about these demonstrations. But in some universities, they're really taking them into account to change things in more legal and structural ways. The, the piece was also part of the uh, uh, Radical Women opening in Los Angeles. And I thought Los Angeles, an exhibition where it's mostly feminist, we're not going to get a lot of answers because there's also like this myth, myth that Latin American men and particularly Mexican men are very macho, like if it didn't happen elsewhere in different ways. And uh, it filled up immediately. You know, we had answers also immediately. So I also to, to question this myth, these myths about how violence happens and where it happens. I think it's something that happens in most places. I was asked to do it in a high school. The students asked me to do it. And there it was interesting because a public, it's a public space, but it's also a private space. And the answer here, for example, is of a young woman who wrote, I lost my, my, I lost my, my, my uncle made me lose, my uncle raped me. I couldn't move for two days. And I was so disgusted, I couldn't eat for three days. If you're a teenager, it's going to be very difficult to go up and hang that answer yourself because then everybody's going to know who it is. It's not you, the, the anonymous part of the whole piece gets lost. And we were worried about if a teacher was denounced, then the school was going to get freaked out and they were, were they going to take the clothesline down as not, and nothing was going to really happen. So they made an agreement with the authorities that all the answers would be put into this box Someone else would hang them so that the anonymity would be uh, maintained. And the ones that really denounced the teachers or students would be given to the authorities with their promise that they would look into it. So it's finding different ways of, of, of trying to get this work, not just to denounce, but also to eventually change this happening. I did it at the National Museum of Women in the Arts. And there it was very interesting because they asked me to work in a, uh, in a house for um, women uh, in, in violence condition, women who I, I, I get the terms mixed up in English and Spanish, uh, uh, women who were running away from, from violence. And it was, it was very difficult. I usually go to places where I am asked to go. I, I, I facilitate, I give advice, et cetera. When I've been asked, I don't usually go to a community but the museum was very interested in having me work with the House of Ruth, I think it's called, because they wanted their art programs to be more in touch with the community. So I went there, I went where, there with my daughter who usually helps me as a psychologist is now doing her PhD in feminist uh, studies. And um, I, I, we went to the House of Ruth and obviously it, it was very difficult because I was there talking to this group of mostly African American women, mostly women from from very poor backgrounds, uh, which are conditions I don't, which are uh, which I don't know. When I talked to the Latin women over there, I had no problem. We said hello, hello, and we had the same codes, you know. I didn't know. I have never worked in a house for battered women, so I didn't know. I knew it was really stupid of me to be there talking to them about violence. 
So I could feel the workshop going down and down and down. And then I told my daughter, you know what? You go on one side of the table and I go on the other side of the table and just ask them, what do you want to ask? And it was very interesting to me because then we got the attention back. It was not like right now I'm telling you what I've done, but you tell me what you've done. I'm here to learn. And one of the questions that came out was, what did you, re how, what did you do to regain your joy after experiencing violence or harassment? Which blew my head. From the Judeo-Christian Judeo background I come from, you would never think of regaining your joy. If you want to heal, maybe, but this was really mind blowing. And uh, I was there for a few days and I was mostly at the sitting down at my piece because I think it's important to be there. I don't like to just leave them there and talking to the student, you know? And for example, I was very moved by a young woman who came and she started telling me that, no, at her university, she really didn't find any harassment. And then I started asking because that's my job, no? And, and do you go to parties? And said, no, because the first party I went to, a group of boys surrounded me. And then they started pulling, pushing me from one side to the other from my trousers. So I've never gone back to a party. And then she said, oh, that's harassment. I said, yes, no. And I was also very moved by a couple of girls that came in and they started in their telephones immediately. And I was very curious. And they said, we're communicating with a friend of ours who lives in, I don't remember what country. And someone threw, threw uh, acid in her face and she formed an organization. And the way she has recovered her joy is by forming this organization. So every time it's a great experience. At the National Museum, they also, they usually have a, a lecture and a dinner with the participants of the project. And I think in the end it worked because the Latino women came. They had never been in a museum because they're worried they're going to ask them for their uh, ID. And many of them are in the United States illegally. And uh, the black women had never come to the museum either. And it was very interesting to me that they came, they participated, and we had managed to make them feel comfortable enough to come into this situation they had never, they had never felt welcome to in the in the museum. We also, if you see in the image of the clothesline, we had little pieces of paper in white, uh, which talked about for those who can't talk, because particularly with the Latino community, you can't denounce the men in your community because then everybody gets kicked out of the country or put in jail. So they can't talk, they can't even, it's very hard to defend themselves when you're in this situation. So each piece has sort of been very different, you know? In Argentina, I did it and a group of teachers participated and it was very interesting because they did it with their students, high school students. And a few months after the high school students have done it, they wrote to me and said, we want to use the clothesline because in a high school near us, uh, a trans girl just committed suicide because of all the bullying. And we want to do a clothesline in support. I said, sure, of course, anything I can help you in. And when the clothesline and the project that I had been to was shown in the exhibition, we included these students to participate and be part of the work. So I, I love the way the piece can work to each, can go to each other context, you know? I did it in Portland and there I work with students because they have a program at the, at the Martin Luther King School where they do artwork with, with kids. So it was interesting to me on how to think of a question so that they could talk about everything that is wrong in their school. So the question was something like, what would make you happier in your school? So everything that makes them unhappy comes out without necessarily asking what makes you happy in school. And the place was done, the piece was done at the university and at a gallery as well. So it, 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 in the same space, it can work in different ways. In Japan, it was done at the Aichi Journal, and this is like the mutant clothesline because uh, it started as a part of the Triennale in this very labyrinthical uh, design because they, the, the curators thought women would be very shy to participate and they wanted to give them some space. The clothesline was almost full by the next three days. Nagoya, where this took place, they has the metro and they also separate at certain times in the day, men and women. So they obviously have a very clear harassment problem, you know? 
Then there was a censorship problem at the IG Trenal, uh, among other things, because this piece on the left, uh, it, it's a piece by two Korean artists, and uh, it talks about the comfort women, who were the women from Korea and Japan that were forced by the Japanese army to serve as prostitutes for their army. And Korea has been uh, demanding, uh, um, um, I don't know how you say it, for Japan to excuse themselves to say they're sorry about this. And it hasn't happened and they're very radical about it. So all the Latin American artists, we decided to close our, our works because we understood this was harassment. This was uh, censorship. And we are very used to censorship and very, 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 and not happy to comply with it, even if it's in our own exhibitions. So I took the pieces, the, the answers down and then put blank papers throwing on the floor. And then Japanese artists in the exhibition asked me if they could use it to, to put outside where the, uh, the censorship had taken place and to talk about freedom of expression. And then the group I worked with when I gave to work, give a workshop have continued working with the clothesline. For example, in these that are called the flower demonstrations where Japanese women are working to change the law because in Japan, the law is that a man won't be put in jail unless a woman proves that she did everything humanly possible to avoid being raped, even if she was six years old and it was her father or if she was raped at gunpoint or when she was uh, passed out, you know? So they've been using the piece as part of these demonstrations. And right now, very amazingly, this feminist boutique in a mall where with a lot of very young people go, asked me to do it. And uh, they did it and they talk about women's image and women in fashion. And uh, that's at the beginning. Now it's full of answers. And they made things like their, their socks of the clothesline, which I thought was very, very cute. But it's interesting because they make all these clothes, uh, t-shirts and stickers and things that they sell. And most of that money goes to buy books that have to do with gender that are then donated to schools. So it's like a, a, a good circle, you know, it's the opposite of a vicious circle, a, a virtuous circle that everything goes to help the same cost. One of the most painful ones for me was this one in Mexico which is in an area in Cuernavaca, which is about a, a, an hour from Mexico City. And they asked me to do it because in the community where the cultural center is, there had been a feminicide of a young 13 year old. So the question here is, do you know a woman who has disappeared or been murdered? And many of the answers were yes. So I think this is probably the most painful one, but it was also important for people to start talking about it. And uh, I always have an answer, a question that has to do with denouncing the violence, but also a question that has to do with what have you done? What could you do to, to combat this? What would you like to do against this, this violence? So that we also start sharing the, uh, what we've done about it and that it's not just uh, victimized or re-victimizing the whole situation. This one I think you'll find very interesting. It's in Indiana. And I was asked to go there by a group that is called Women for Change that was formed just, af just after Trump uh, became president by Republican and Democrat women to work together against violence against women. And they asked me to go and give this workshop because they're working to change the law on consent. So after I gave the workshop, they went to every county in, in Indiana and asked ask for and, and not answers, you know? And then this is in the, I don't know what it is, the legislative uh, office where the people who make the law are and they took their answers. And right now it has gone back and forth, uh, the legislation. I'm not very clear how it works over there, but the law has, they've made a lot of changes and they were only waiting for the governor to, to approve it. So I think it's really interesting how they have used it and how it has been uh, um, from art used by the activists and then used to change the, uh, the law. Uh, I think it might be interesting for them to, for you to talk to them at some point as well in how this has, has worked. The clothesline in Mexico has become like a, 
like the Me Too. They do it in every university. They do, everybody does it. It's like, uh, they don't even know that I started it very often. And I, I collect the information I get from it in different country, in different states, in different places, uh, in an educational and, or an activist or an artistic project. And, and uh, I keep the information. Uh, recently, I've become very interested, particularly the, with the young women who are using it as, as an analog me too, as I say because they have often received violence. So I'm trying to find ways to work with them when they want so that they can be more protected and that they do these clothes lines that denounce, but they can keep the anonymity of those who organized it or they're working with feminist lawyers that can protect them or they're finding other ways to protect themselves because many of them have, have received a lot of, of violence. Also so that their answers can be used in different ways and not just in the protest, but after, like it's being used in all these ways. I find it interesting that I'm also being invited by university museums to present the clothesline, but to university museums where the young women have done their clotheslines and they have not paid attention to them. So I always say, okay, I'll do it, but only if I work with the women who have been doing uh, the clotheslines and the ones that have closed the faculty. If they participate, I participate. If they don't participate, I don't, because if not, I'm being asked as, a, as an artist to go in and legitimize the university that has not paid any attention to the, to the students. So, so I refuse to do that. So then they tell me, do you want to present another piece? And I say, I'm sorry, but I can't participate if, if it's not with the, with the students, because I would propose something else to work with the, with the students. This is a, an interesting example because I did it at the university in Chihuahua. And then the people from the art faculty did it in different faculties over the next two years. And it was interesting that after they had done it, a couple of weeks later, the students would get together and do a clothesline with denouncing. So I think it was giving them like the strength uh, to know that, that they could talk and that we weren't alone. And this sort of uh, started rolling the, the student work. I recently did it in, in Likam in, in college. I don't know how you pronounce it. And it was interesting because it's always, or what I'm interested in doing, it's, it's a group project. It's a group project where the, the, the students are the ones who get the answers who make the questions, even if it's facilitated by their teacher, who in this case is an art historian who is very close to my work. Or, and, or and, and, and I participate with them, but it's their work and, and it has to be meaningful to them. The, very recently, the, the clothesline has been changed, uh, jumping, for example, in a group of women from the Catholic Church, or it's being used to denounce the men who don't pay um, the, I don't know how you call it over there, but they, 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 they don't pay for when they're divorced, they don't pay for the maintenance of their children. Child support. A child support. So that one is being very, very, very successful because they do it in the hometown and then the families come out and say how, how shameful and they're the ones that pressure the men to, to, to do this. Another interesting one is this one in the back, which is we've, we've been recently getting a lot of, uh, of harassment from our own government that we wanted to send a govern, uh, an ambassador to Panama and an, a historian who is well known for being a harasser. He's been denounced by the women in his party. He's been denounced by a lot of people. So women here made a big scandal. And the president came out to say that uh, there's no official uh, legal cases against him. So he can't say that he's guilty. So I've been, uh, uh, this, this, uh, hashtag came out that says I didn't denounce because or I denounced but that is starting to visualize all the problems because it's expensive because it takes a lot of time because they don't pay any attention to you because they victimize you when you do it because there's not enough support all the things that you probably know a lot better than than I do and they made this close line in the this is where the the statue of Columbus was and the statue of Columbus was taken down supposedly to protect it, but because of all the protests. 
And then a group of women, they were going to put another sculpture there and there was a big scandal. And then groups of women took it and put this little figure on top and they declared it the roundabout of women who fight and struggle. And around it are all the names of women and, and uh, of different professions that have disappeared or have been murdered and the groups of women who are organized. And, uh, and uh, it's called now, I don't know how long it will last, but it's very, it's very moving to be there, you know, with all, the, uh, with all these names and this monument to what has happened. And uh, this year they made a clothesline because the one last, the one November, they came the next day and it was thrown away in the trash. It was just a few sticks, you know? So this year they did it with metal and cement and with cloth, cloth and, it's, and it's there, you know, talking about, I do, uh, why didn't I denounce because I didn't re recognize it as abuse at the time because it's uh, the son, uh, the son, uh, my mother's son and I can't do it because I tried it and nothing happened. So you have all these answers there. And the group that is doing it is mostly psychologists and lawyers. So they're going to take these answers and continue working with the legal system to talk about these things, you know? So it's, I'm very excited. I'm almost over. Uh, this is a work of art by an artist that dresses herself in the clothesline. But what is very moving is that she says that on one hand, it's the part of denouncing but on the other part, the most important part is feeling accompanied. So the clothesline has this thing of feeling and not feeling alone and feeling accompanied. There's a blog that has a lot of information on the, on the clothesline. I try to keep it up to date. It doesn't happen often, but when this is sort of part of the story of the clothesline and if there's any comments or questions, I'd be more than glad to, to try to answer them. Thank you so much. This was so much more than what I, I would ever, I think what we asked for. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us, to speaking to our students, for allowing us to record this. Um, questions, comments, what do you all think? Hey, um, I was wondering if you've ever like experienced like, I don't like men telling you, you shouldn't do this or men telling you that what you're doing is wrong and like making men look bad or anything like that? Not, not personally when I do the, the clotheslines, but the students who have done it at their own universities, yes, they have received a lot of, 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 of backlash, you know? What I have had is a lot, many men, not a whole lot of men, but many coming up and telling me, can I write my answer? Because I was also harassed and I've never spoken about it. And I find that they find it it's harder for them to talk about being harassed. So I always say, yes, just cross. If the question says uh, men, just cross it out and write it. And, uh, and uh, yes, I think everybody can participate. Uh, but yes, when other women, when, uh, when students have done it, they find a lot of harassment. Anyone else? Let's see, Alexandra, what do you think? Any comments? We'll do our little takeaway. What did you get out of this? Um, I thought the presentation was really good. And I wanted to ask, like, does it bother you that you often don't get credit for something that you started? Because like, if you look up, like, who started the project, someone in Massachusetts came up and they did it, like, 20 years after you. So are you, like, upset about that? Or are you, or are you just glad that people are doing this project and bringing awareness to these issues? I think the, the, they're both, if you see one clothesline and the other, they're both different. They share the same name and some of the same features, but they're different. I don't mind. I think what we should do is get together and share. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't mind, as an artist, I think the biggest compliment is when a piece of yours becomes popular culture. So I do have to be careful. I do try to, to have the blog and have the information available. Uh, not because of me, but because I all, uh, I think it's important that it's recognized as an art project. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that it's recognized as a feminist art project and where it came from. I, 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 that, that's the only reason. But uh, except for one group that took it and did it and didn't give any credit when I was having the big exhibition, so it was obvious 
where it came from. And I wrote to them nicely and I said, well, you know, this has to do with my clothesline. It was the same format, the same questions, the same everything, and they never answered. So they're the, the pirate clothesline. <laughs> I didn't talk about them today, but, but I don't get upset about it. It's more surprising to me than anything, you know, everything that has happened. I never imagined anything like this would happen. And Jenna, what do you think? I was really inspired by everything that you said. And I participated in the project last year here at campus. If I had one question for you, I guess it would be, if you could do anything different, what would you do and why? No, I don't think I would do ever, anything different because uh, the one thing I have done is try to be flexi flexible, to change with uh, as, as they go and to learn, to accumulate experience and try to share it in other places. So I did, I've always done what I could with what, I, with, with what I've had. I, I know what I have to do and then what I haven't done and what I, what I need to start doing at some point, which is, for example, making a book. Mm. Making a book and, and having something uh, more, more documentation, et cetera, et cetera happen so that that has to that has to happen i i also find as an artist that something that i question very often is that if you see all the international events i've been asked to go to it's for one piece like if i didn't ha if i hadn't worked i always say it was one of my first pieces i could have done that and nothing else you know but how to make the whole the whole body of work being known because there's different questions I, I ask that have to do with art and activism and have to do with a feminist way of understanding art. And I know that's something else I have to work on, that uh, my work isn't just seen as the clothesline because it's one of the pieces, you know? And sometimes I think I'm going to stop doing the clothesline uh, so that I can, I can concentrate on other works and have them be known better. But then a, a, a group of uh, young mid, midwives just asked me to do a clothesline. Well, obviously I go and I talk to them and I, and I facilitate and, and work with them to do it. So as, an, as a feminist, I can't stop doing it. As, a, as, an, as an activist, I can't stop doing it. As an artist, it makes me question what I'm doing to my own work, you know? But the feminist wins. <laughs> and uh, Brendan? Uh, can you hear me? Yep, we hear you. I I think it's super. I think it's super cool how this is. It's one of the only art pieces I think I've ever seen that uh, that kind of like it varies depending on context. Like you see, most art pieces will mean the same thing no matter where they're presented or where they are. So I'm not sure if I have any questions, but I do think it's really cool how. Uh, Obviously, Brendan's on campus, so yeah. that's why there was all that noise. But I'm really glad that um, Brendan, my nephew, raised that point um, mm -hmm. because. Could you, could you repeat it? Because I. Yeah. 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 Uh, remember, Monica, you were telling us uh, the other day when we were speaking about how delighted you were that mm -hmm. each clothesline in the different uh, communities reflects di the different way that, for example, um, gender based anxieties are reflected in that culture. So it's like a lens through which mm -hmm. you can understand what's going on in each different culture. Yeah. And then for me, that's very important. I, I think it's like a, a basic way of understanding art as a feminist, mm. that art has to do with its context and art has to do about the, with the relationship um, establishing with the, with the people and it's a collaborative piece. It's not the artist genius that comes and, and presents a piece. Uh, so for me, that's very, very important. And it's the way I also learn a lot of things. Mm. So yeah, that makes a difference for me, it's, it's important. And like I was fascinated to learn about like what the women in Mexico, even mm -hmm. today, like, you know, we know that there are different cultural 
mores and um, different stages of, of equality and opportunities. But to hear what some of the women were still saying in, in Mexico about their experiences on public transportation or in the university, I think would really shock a lot of students at Adelphi, but maybe not, maybe I don't know. That's why you know I was hoping that some of you guys might shed some insight into what is it, what experiences have you had and have you ever had to think about your safety? Um, I know that some of the, the guys in my classes, when they found in the past, when they found out what some women do on a regular basis, sometimes without thinking reflexively to keep themselves safe, yeah. they were shocked because they didn't know because they don't walk in those shoes. Hmm. Camille? Um, I thought the presentation was really good and um, very interesting. So my question would be, um, looking back on all the years that you've been a part of the Clothesline Project, if there is, what is the one thing that you would change about it? Mm -hmm. of, of this piece in particular? Yeah. No, not really. Not, but, well, there is one thing actually, now that, that you mention it again. I, I have not kept all the answers. Mm -hmm. The first ones I didn't keep because I never thought the piece would be, anybody would ever be interested in it. And I probably moved from one place to another and I didn't have space to keep it. And I just threw it away. I always, I always, I had always thought I had kept the answers, but I, I have, they haven't appeared anywhere yet. So I probably threw them away. So that's one thing I've done. And, and now I know that they could have been useful through, throughout the time and all of them. Today, I don't keep them all because, for example, the ones at the National Museum, I donated the piece to the museum. So they have their, their, uh, their answers. They're all in the, they, they have a site where you can see them all. The museum in, in the new fields in Indiana, they also keep their answers because they're using them. So some I keep and some I don't. And I haven't had the, the resources or the time to, to keep all of them. I have the ones from Japan and I have a, from Argentina, I have a few of them, but not all of them. That I think would be interesting at some point to try to bring them together and to compare them because they're an invaluable material. Mm. I wanted to comment that the times I've done it in the United States at campuses, they all, the, ans, they, the clothesline gets filled up very fast. Mm. Interesting. Mm. Vincent? Yeah, uh, my question would be, I, I know you briefly touched on it, but like, I don't know how, I know the media can be a little bit misleading, but like, is the government, I know like the government in Mexico tends to be corrupt and then with like a few other like issues like with cartels and everything like that. Do you find that the government is like one of your bigger, I don't want to say enemies, but like uh, people that block your movement than more of like regular citizens? It's, it's always very complex. Because, for example, the <clears throat> on the one hand, we have a, a special prosecutor for gender for for cases that have to do with women and gender violence, which who's amazing, mm -hmm. and they've named someone who has a lot of experience who's a feminist. So, on one hand, we have laws that apparently are very useful. Uh, it, it, I can't think of the government as one thing. I mean, we have a government that has almost 50-50 men and women. So in one thing, they're very equal. But we have a president who is a very old-fashioned, mm -hmm. a very old-fashioned politician and a very old-fashioned man who sometimes says very dumb things. Mm -hmm. There's, uh, it's, it's interesting right now because, for example, we've had the last few demonstrations. We had a very big demonstration about three years ago where the women painted all the national monuments and it was a big scandal. And uh, they broke uh, glasses in the metro station and they, 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 it was a more violent protest. And now when we have protests, the government in the city, which is not the federal government, it's the same party, but it's still not. Oh. Mm. Oh, Monica froze. Yeah, hopefully she'll come back on. Thank you all for participating so actively.
Are you guys excited for the clothesline project? Put it on your calendars, April 14th. <laughs> now that's, um, a, that's a joke. It's not that. <laughs> Let's see, maybe just another but, budget too. Um, what was that, Monica? Now that I was saying that the next day, the whole barrier was covered with the names of all the women who've been murdered and flowers. Oh my God. So it's very interesting how the feminist movement has taken to, to answering. It's very, very amazing. Wow. That was it. Uh, Philip, do you have anything to say? Yeah, I thought this was really inspiring as well. The fact that like you gave the girls the opportunity to write like down everything that happened to them. Because a lot of times I know girls get embarrassed by this and they don't want to speak about it. So they were able to like express themselves through writing and just get it down on that paper and see it and really like visualize like, hey, this did happen to me. Like I need to speak out about this. And maybe one more, Kenyatta. Oh, here's Kenyatta. Um, Kenyatta's question is, did you ever imagine that the clothesline project would become so popular? If it didn't, would you still did be you doing it? Did you ever imagine the clothesline project? No, I, I never imagined. Wow. I never ever imagined all this would happen. The only good thing is that I was open enough to, 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 to work with it, you know, and see it, and see it coming. I don't well, remember the, la the last qu the question before this one. Um, the comment before this one. I think it was Philip that said um, that um, what he likes about it is that women are able to put what they've experienced or what they feel down mm -hmm. on uh, uh, writing it. They may not be able to say it, but just being able to express it and put it out there is healing, right? Having that yeah. opportunity to get That's it out. I, I just wanted to say it is I'm not giving anybody an opportunity. It's a piece that has to do with self-defense. Self-defense, yes. Yeah. Interesting. Well, we, our clothesline project will be on um, April, what do we say? Um, 14th. On April 14th. Um, we will have the way Stephanie Lakes class has it every year since, I don't know, maybe 12 years now, is it? Or more? More. Than um, yeah, more. We will have the t-shirts, but we will also have the pink cards. Um, uh, we will have students get together a few questions. We'll narrow them down to just a couple. We don't want to have too many, right? Um, and we'll invite all the students to give their ideas. We'll take a vote and we will share it with you, Monica. We'll share pictures. Okay, and okay. just be careful that the, the questions that are open very open so that anybody can answer them and all experiences come in. And I would appreciate if you also have a question that asks what you've done so that you have the both, the both ah, versions so a, a, a of the problems, but also of what they have done. So the problem- Asking what they have done. Got it. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank um, you so much, Monica. Monica, we'll have you back for Artivism for, um, uh, it'll be like this in the fall, if you're up to it, um, for our okay. Artivism initiative. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Okay. My class, Perfect. all good? Thank you so much. It was so lovely to meet you. I'm so happy we found you. <laughs> Thank you, be well. I'm glad, I'm glad too. It was very, thank you. bye. Bye, bye, bye. Thank yeah. you class. I appreciate you participating in the way you did.